so <clears throat> we're going to pick up where we left off a little while ago in the Gospel of John. Please take your Bibles, turn to Gospel of John chapter 4. <clears throat> so what we're going to look at today is the story of the woman at the well and uh, her meeting with Christ. There's a few things I just want to point out in here and just go over this a little bit and uh, see what the Lord has for us. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for this day. Lord, just ask that you bless this time, this reading of your word, the Lord, that it would be a true blessing to our hearts and minds, that your spirit would speak to us and teach us, and that, Lord, you put a, a hedge of protection about us, that, Lord, that this be a time of rejoicing and bringing you honor and glory. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Okay, so in John chapter 4, I'm going to start at verse 4, and uh, it's an interesting, uh, I always talk about, pay attention to the words, the specific words, why was it put this way? It does not say that he went through Samaria. It doesn't say that he, uh, that the just, you know, kind of needed to go through Samaria. It says he must go. Look at this. And he must needs go through Samaria. There's a great impression made here of the work of Christ, and it's something that he just absolutely had to do. Now, if we go down, I want to point out something. And he must needs go through Samaria. Then cometh he to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near to the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there, Jesus there, being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. Now, what I want to do is go down to verse 27. And it, as it says, And upon this came his disciples, and marveled that he talked with the woman, yet no man said, What seekest thou, or why talkest thou with her? Okay, now go back to verse 6. So what we see here is Jesus separating from his group. As uh, the disciples, uh, if you uh, read in other passages, uh, they went, went to town to get food and whatnot. And, but Jesus didn't go with them. He had to go do this. So what is this all, a little bit of a picture of leaving the 90 and 9 to find the 1? Right there, the great shepherd leaving the 90 and 9 to go find the 1. He must needs go through because there is one there he had to find. There's one there he had to meet. And so let's go back to verse 6. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus therefore being wearied with his journey. Now wearied uh, from the, his work, from the ministry, but also uh, there's an application as I'm thinking about this and just meditating on this passage that how a shepherd trying to find that one would be wearied with the searching, the great lengths that God would go through to find the one, to save the one, that how far God will go to save one. It, that's one thing I see down through the scripture so many times and with so many others, like even with ourselves, how far did the Lord go to save you? How long did he deal with you? Did he talk with you? Did he draw you and try to impress upon you the, the, the seriousness of this, uh, the lengths that he will go? And how and they, we see this application of weariness of God and of how he, we weary him with our sin and all these things. But this, as he's wearied with the searching, with the work, trying to talk to the people to show them, to help them to see and understand. Wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well. He knew, he knew that she was going to come here. They see the foreknowledge of God at work. And it was about the sixth hour. There cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Now in the infinite uh, mind of God, he's sitting there. He can see her bustling about in her home, watching her get her pot, coming out. And now this is just my personal just thoughts on it, my personal opinion do you think Jesus smirked, grinning, 
watching her boss about knowing what's going to happen and here she comes he and he filled with joy knowing what's going to happen how she's getting closer getting closer he, he's looking up oh, there she is she's coming closer you can see it i see that as my lord that's the kind of jesus i believe in as he's a god of joy and he's filled with joy about <coughs> salvation about the work and all these things and he's filled with joy when people come and search him now she clearly had an open mind about this. Uh, she had a, a heart that would be willing to hear it. And now we're going to look into this. There cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus says to her, give me to drink. Now, do you think Jesus just wanted a cup of water here? Or is there some other meaning to this? Because look at this. For his disciples are gone away into the city to buy meat. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, askest drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Now, Jesus, break, breaking down tradition, man's divisions are not doctrine. The Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. God does. And God did not intend there to be such divisions. All people are made in the image of God. As it says, I believe it's Acts 17, 26, it, uh, uh, God has made all the nations of the earth of one blood. We create the divisions. We create the us versus them. But that's not how the Lord intended it. That's not what the Lord wanted. The only differences should be saved and unsaved. That's what the scriptures say. But we see here, how is it that thou, being a Jew, askest drink of me? Now, is it possible, just one thought that I have had in thinking about this, is it possible that because of the divisions that we see between the Samaritans and the Jews, that it's possible this, this created division could have caused a possibility that would have kept her from being able to come closer to the knowledge of the truth? There's something to think about. But we see the truth coming to her. She was unable to go because the Samaritans Jews have no dealings with each other. Jesus answered said to her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked him, and he would have given thee living water. So you see a dual purpose here. Now, I've used this passage of, this, of the Samaritan woman at the well here as one of the absolute greatest examples of Jesus teaching how to evangelize because he uses what's at hand to break the surface to start conversation she's come to get water he's sitting at the well so he uses the water as an opportunity to open up conversation and Jesus the greatest evangelist here showing us the simplicity of how to use what's around us that at our disposal to be able to open up opportunities for evangelism. So we see this. If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, give me to drink. So we see here him perking her interest as something to ponder, to think about. Well, who are, who are you then? If thou knewest the gift of God, and who, who it is that saith to thee, so immediately in her mind she'd be thinking, well, yeah, who are you? Who are you? And so using that, who is Jesus? Who is Jesus to you? That's, that's what you start evangelism with, the person of Jesus Christ, not with denominationalism, traditions, rituals, or whatever else, or uh, what fruit you're bearing or whatever, but who is Jesus? That's all that matters. Who is Jesus Christ? Give me to drink. Who is it that saith to thee, give me to drink? Thou wouldest have asked him, and he would have given thee living water. The woman saith unto him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence then hast thou that living water? Now, what I want to do is just pause here for a second. I want to read something. I wrote this a little while ago, and I just want to share it with you. <clears throat> it's called Sychar's Well. Again the sun rises, chores filling the mind. Drudgery of life constant, all joy empty due to sin's constant pine. Another dry day in Sychar, 
lips parched and heart heavy. The only well is distanced, feet heavy with her emotions marred. Her back aching under the weight, thin hands worn to bone, life giving her only an empty pate, wishing for a happy home. Five times she searched for life, five times tied the knot, five times failures dashed, can't believe this is her lot. Nearing closer to the well, one person sitting by. She wishes she'd be left alone, but no point on that she thinks to dwell. The man begs a cup of water, a simple thing to give, a moment in her dreary day, but it's water itself that's caught her. The water of life pierces her heart, rejoicing her mind, lifting the load. True life is found in offered water, reviving her soul by the word that was sowed. The water of life overflowing her cup has come to her home to feast and to sup. Her life now given meaning, revealing much needed purpose and grace. For Jesus, now her wellspring has washed away all sin's trace. Just thinking about water, this simple phrase about asking for water. This brings in so much thought of the dryness of her life, dryness of her soul, the dryness of her mind, because we keep reading, the woman said, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. It's hard to get at. It's hard to find that, to achieve that which is needed. From whence then hast thou that living water? Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well and drank thereof himself and his children and his cattle? So she's dwelling in the past. She's not thinking about the power of God in the present. She's thinking only about the past. Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again, but whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well, a well of water springing up into everlasting life. He immediately turns it around to spiritual. She's stuck in the physical. She's stuck in the past. And as we will also see, the issues and problems in her life that Jesus immediately puts his finger on. But Jesus immediately addresses that which is needed and then him, his person. The need of water, the need of life, life-giving water, as water itself brings life. So he uses this analogy with himself right off the bat to draw her in to help her to see. Whosoever drinketh of this water will thirst again. Physical water, traditions, rituals, goodness, deeds, all the things that you could possibly do will dry up, will not bring life. But whosoever drinketh of what I give, not what you give, not what you can achieve, not what you can labor away, slave away at trying to draw up, you're going to have to come again and again, but I can give you something that is eternal, everlasting life. And the woman says, sir, give me this water. Immediately she wants it. Immediately, she wants this. He knows exactly where to go with this. It, in, in evangelism, the one thing that is greatly needed to be understood is to not get drawn off, to stay on point, to stay on topic. People will try to circle around. People try to bring up other points and topics or with their questions or whatever, but there's a purpose and a point you'd want to bring in need, need and the person of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> the woman says, Sir, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. She wants what he's offering, but she doesn't have the full understanding. So he's perked interest. He's perked interest. He's, uh, he's got, her, got her wanting to know who he is and what he's about. He's, he says, I have something that's really special. Give me this water that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. Jesus saith unto her, Go, call thy husband, and come hither. God commands all men everywhere to repent. If you want what I'm offering, repent and believe the gospel. It's that simple. You don't have to labor in anything. You don't have to do anything. I've completed all the work. All that is needed to be done, I've drawn it up. I've, I've got it all prepared. It's ready here. It's a gift. You don't have to pay anything. You don't have to do anything but believe. Go call thy husband and come hither. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. 
Jesus said to her, Thou hast well said, I have no husband, for thou hast had five husbands, and he whom thou now hast is not thy husband. In that saidest thou truly. The woman saith unto her, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and ye say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Immediately she knows. She knows. And like a... Uh, Pastor Paul has pointed out from time to time when uh, talking with people and witnessing evangelism, you look a person in the eye and you say, we all know that we're sinners, don't we? And everyone knows. Everyone knows. Everyone is aware of this. And she knows this. She knows what she's done is wrong. She knows that she's in sin. She knows that she's a sinner. But out of embarrassment, awkwardness, or whatever, she, she wants to try to get away from that, wants to try to step back. But Jesus presses on. Jesus presses on. We see an evangelism is pushing the point. Pushing the point. There must be understanding. Thou hast well said. Thou hast truly said. The woman says, I perceive thou art a prophet. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and ye say then Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus saith unto her, woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship ye know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. God does not dwell in temples made with hands, but in the hearts that we see belief, and it's not about buildings and locations, it's not about tapestries, it's not about deeds and works, it's not about the phylacteries of the Pharisees and the legalisms, it's about spirit. It's about spirit, it's the water of spirit, it's the truth of spirit. This is what, what we get at, because so many people when they hear religion, when they hear about Jesus, they think of the person, the physical person of Jesus, the physical cross, they think about the physicality of the, uh, of the gospel, the things that Jesus did. Yes, these all happened. Yes, Jesus physically existed, but to know that is one thing, but to believe in the spiritual truth is the other. It's the spiritual truth that saves. Yes, he shed blood, but was the blood for? Yes, he went to the cross, but was the cross for? Yes, he was here physically, but was he physically here for? So many people, they don't understand the spiritual point of evangelism, the spiritual point of the gospel. We know what we worship to know, to know of heart. As you see in, in Romans 10, 9 to 10, confess with thy mouth the belief of your heart. It goes deeper than understanding. Deeper than understanding. She understood about worship, but why? Why? What was she worshiping? She's, she's being faithful to God. Look what she says. Our fathers worship in this mountain. Ye say that Jesus. She's arguing religion while lost in sin. She's arguing religion. She's arguing worship and religion while she's lost in sin. She has knowledge. She has knowledge, but it's not put into proper place. The hour cometh and now is when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. In spirit and in truth. And we see that she understands this, but she's been kind of running from it. She's been kind of running from it. And this is why Jesus had to meet her, to point it out, to give her the clarification, to give her understanding. For the natural man receiveth not the things that be of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, for they are spiritually discerned. It takes the Spirit of God to understand the Word of God. She has the base knowledge, but she doesn't have the full understanding. Look at this, verse 25. The woman says, I know. I know. I know that Messiah comes, which is called Christ. When he has come, he will tell us all things. She, she knows, has a knowledge of the Christ. She has a knowledge of the water. She has a knowledge, a, a base understanding of what needs to be done. But she's never been challenged on it. She's never really been brought face to face with it. She's only been, been maybe just lightly told, but it's never been driven home. I know that Messiah comes, which is called Christ. And when he has come, he will tell us all things. Jesus says, I had to speak unto thee and me. 
One little phrase. I am he. That's who I am. Her whole world immediately turned upside down. We take a look at what Jesus is saying. Now, as we see here, she has a base understanding. And as I said up earlier, the whole point is, who is Jesus Christ? Who is the Christ? You say you believe in the Christ. Look, this woman believed in the Christ. I know that Messiah comes, which is called Christ. She says she, she knew who the Christ was, who the Christ would be. She has a base understanding. And is this not the question of so many? From atheists, Catholics, Muslims, Buddhists, Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses, Hindus, even many professed Christians have trouble putting a finger on the exact explanation. They say, well, he's the Son of God. Yes, this is true. They say he's the Christ Messiah. That's true as well. He's the Lord. He's the Savior. That's true as well. But what else? What else? <clears throat> what else? You see, when we are faced with the true Christ of Scripture, it turns our world upside down. It turns everything that we thought on its head. There's one specific thing about Jesus Christ that sets him apart from all other belief systems. To this woman, who was the Christ Messiah? Not someone that really changed her life. That really convicted her of sin. That convicted her of everything. Convicted her of righteousness and sin and truth. And that caused her to repent and believe in the truth. The Christ she was believing in was not the Christ that Jesus truly is. Because when he really presented himself of who he was, and what happened? Verse 27, there came, and upon this came his disciples and marveled that he talked with the woman, yet no man said, what seekest thou or why talkest thou with her? The woman then left her water pot and went her way into the city and said to the men, come see a man who told me all things that ever I did. Is not this the Christ? So Jesus opened her understanding and she had the light bulb moment, a moment of enlightenment, and she acted upon it. Is not this the Christ? And she, as it says, she and many believed. What is it that Jesus revealed to her? She says, which told me all things that ever I did. Why, why is that so amazing to her? She says she knew that the Messiah Christ would come, but why is it so amazing to her that he knew her secrets. Does she not understand that the Christ is God? You see, Jesus is not an angel, Hebrews 2.16, for verily he took not him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. Proverbs 30, verse 4, Who hath ascended up into heaven or descended? Who hath gathered the wind in his fist? Who hath bound the waters in a garment? Who hath established all the ends of the earth? What is his name? And what is his son's name, if thou canst tell? The Son of God. God the Son. God coming down. That she, she knew some of the words, some of the terms of theology, some of the ideas. She had a base grasp of religion, but she has never met the person. She has never met Christ. She has never met the person truly according to the scriptures. She was only shown traditions in the name of, rituals in the name of. She was given some base terminologies and ideas in the name of because, it, it, because she's, as we see, unrepentant, unconvicted. She had no problems uh, being in what she was in. It didn't change her. True salvation will change you, will it not? Think about it. If the spirit of the almighty, sovereign Lord God is living inside of you, is it possible to have the spirit of almighty God in you and it not affect you? No, he'll be changed. It'll change you, change you drastically. So who is, this, who is this person that this woman then, looking for, through her eyes, who is this person that's sitting there? This man, unassuming man, that she... Didn't even have really much of a thought of. Sitting there, as you see in Isaiah, no form nor comeliness. He looked like the average John Smith sitting there, just asking her for a drink of water. And then such power came, comes out of him in words. A truth that grabs her heart and mind and changes her life. 
What, what, is, what is this that he now showed her? He told me all things that ever I did. That phrase right there goes to show that she understood that Jesus is God. We look at uh, Jesus in the scriptures. Isaiah 7, 14, the Messiah Christ will be born of a virgin. Micah, Micah 5, 2, the Messiah Christ will be born in Bethlehem. Isaiah 9, 6, the Messiah Christ is called the mighty God, everlasting Father. Isaiah 53, the Messiah Christ will be put to death for our sins and his days will be prolonged, resurrected. Jesus in the gospel said in his name to cast out devils. In the temptation of the wilderness, Jesus rebuked Satan. And again, when Satan tried to rebuke Christ through Peter, Jesus said, get thee behind me, Satan. And then in the temptation of the wilderness, in Matthew chapter 4, Satan is tempting Jesus. Jesus says, is it not written, tempt not the Lord your God? A personal claim, claiming the name of the Lord God. Furthermore, we also see Jesus forgiving sins of people. The crippled man, the woman caught in adultery, Mary who washed his feet with tears, Jesus accepting worship of individuals, the wise men at his birth, the mother of the sons of Zebedee, the blind men, the lepers, Thomas, and the disciples after the resurrection. In John 10, 18, Jesus says he has power to lay down his life and raise himself from the dead. Personal power claim over life and death. In John 10, 27, 28, Jesus says he personally gives eternal life. John 4, 26, Jesus claims to be the Christ Messiah prophesied of in Isaiah 9, 6. And also in John chapter 8, Jesus says he is the I am multiple times. I am in the Greek is ego emi, meaning the always existing one. And the Pharisees tried to stone him for blasphemy. An angel, prophet, or holy man couldn't claim that. Jesus flat out explained in John 8, 24 and 58 that he is the I am. He says this twice, and for the Pharisees knew this, tried to stone him. It is not blasphemous to call yourself an angel. It's not blasphemous to call yourself a prophet or a holy man. It's blasphemous to call yourself God. Jesus says, if you don't believe that he is the I am, you will die in your sins. So what do we see here in John 4? The point that Jesus is making here, claiming to be God. This is what moved her. This is what saved her. We're her coming to the understanding of the deity of Jesus Christ. You can preach Christ. You can preach the cross. You can preach the death, burial, resurrection. But if you're not preaching, if you're not witnessing the deity of Jesus Christ, they're not going to be saved. The people must understand the true Jesus, the person. If you knew who is asking you to, get, to give water, you would say, give me living water. He's emphasizing his true person. He's emphasizing his true person. She talked about the Messiah that comes, which is called Christ. He's called Christ. But he is the Christ, which is God Almighty manifested in the flesh. Come see a man which told me all things that ever I did. Is not this the Christ? You didn't say, is not this the man that thinks himself the Christ or that calls himself the Christ? No, is not this the Christ? She understood the person. She understood the person. Matthew 28, verse 9, And as they went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them, saying, All hail. And they came and held him by the feet and worshipped him. Jesus appears before them and says, All hail. That's invitation to worship. It, where Jesus claimed the deity of, uh, deity of God and invited to worship. We see Ephesians 3, 9, And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hidden God, who created all things by Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is creator God. John 1, 1 and 3, 1 to 3, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word is of God, and the Word was God, the same as in the beginning with God, all things are made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. Hebrews 1, 2, hath in these last days spoken unto us by His Son, whom He hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also He made the worlds. Hebrews 11, 11 3. Through faith we understand that the worlds are framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. Colossians 1.16, For by him who made all things, were, were all things created that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things are created by him and for him. 
Jesus Christ is creator God. Now think about this just for a moment. God Almighty is sitting on the well and says, could you give me a drink of water? God Almighty. That this woman says, that says, uh, uh, are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well? Woman, he made the material that the bricks are made out of. He made the water that is in the well. He, he made the shoes, the material that make up the shoes on your feet. He made the material that are making the pot that you're carrying. She did not understand clearly who she was talking to. She says, I know the Messiah comes. Woman, he's sitting right in front of you. How close Jesus Christ is to everyone. How, how far he will go to draw a single person to salvation. How close he can be. And yet, as, as one preacher said, so close to the cross, but so far from the blood. How they could stare Jesus square in the face, I have no idea. Just like the Pharisees stared him in the face saying, who are you? How, how an individual could say that to the very face of God. Philippians 2, 10 to 11, Then at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now many people know that passage, but are you aware that that, that, that phrase, that verse, is repeated two other times in the Bible? Romans 14, 11. For it is written, as I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. Wait a minute. I thought it says every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Wait a minute. One more. Isaiah 45, 22 to 23. Look unto me and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God, and there is none else. I have sworn by myself, the word has gone out of my mouth in righteousness and shall not return, that unto me every knee shall bow, every tongue shall swear. Every knee will bow to Christ, every tongue will confess to Christ. He says, I am God. Every knee will bow to me and every tongue shall swear to me. 2 Corinthians 5.19 To wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing the trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. We see as well in Acts 20, 28, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock, over the which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers, to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. God purchased the church with his own blood. But wait a minute. Jesus says God is a spirit. And they that worship him is worship him in spirit and in truth. Hold up. Spirits don't bleed. Spirits don't die. Got a bit of a problem. How does that work? Well, Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 to 8. God fashioned a body for himself that he then indwelt and he sent himself to the cross. Because spirits can't bleed, spirits can't die. He therefore made a body that could. He makes a way of escape. Literally, God purchased the church with his own blood. Colossians 2, verses 8 to 9. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. The entire fullness of all that makes up God is in him. The government will be upon his shoulders. This woman thought she understood the Christ. She thought she understood the Messiah. She thought she understood God. She had no idea the lengths that God would go to bring her to enlightenment. Why? Because God is not willing that any should perish. He will weary himself searching for you. God Almighty, that's how far he will go. That's how far he will go. 1 Timothy 3.16 And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. 1 Timothy 4.10 For therefore we both labor and suffer reproach because we trust in the living God, who is the Savior of all men, especially of those that believe. In my favorite verse, 1 John 5.20 And we know that the Son of God has come. 
with the Son of God, God manifest in the flesh, the Son, the body of God, that God then indwelt the sentence of you seen me, you seen the Father. God sitting there in bodily form on the well, talking with the woman, the Son of God has come, given us an understanding. He gave her an understanding that we may know him that is true, the true water. Even in his Son, Jesus Christ, and we are in him that is true, even in his son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. When she met the deity of the Messiah, the deity of the Christ, the power of the living God, what happened? Verse 28. The woman then left her water pot. She, she forsook her life. She forsook her, her own desires. Even, even her thirst for water no longer mattered to her. And went her way into the city. She immediately wanted to tell others about it. Immediately wanted to witness. Immediately wanted to tell others. Went and to, uh, into the way and saith to the men, Come, see a man which told me all things that ever I did. Is not this the Christ? They went out of the city and came unto him. Now you remember at the beginning of John, when Jesus was met and, uh, uh, by the disciples of John the Baptist, and he said, Master, where, where do you dwell? He says, come and see. And then Philip goes and calls Nathaniel, and, says, uh, and Nathaniel's asking, well, who is this one? And Philip says, come and see. Come and see. What do we see here again? Come and see. Come and see this man. Come and see. Come see the true Jesus Christ. Then they went out of the city and came unto him. In the meanwhile, his disciples prayed him, saying, Master, eat. But he said unto them, I have meat to eat that you know not of. Therefore said the disciples one to another, Hath any man brought him up to eat? Jesus saith unto them, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. To do the will of God. What is the will of the Father? That all will come to Christ. That all will come to Christ. Say not ye, there, there are yet four months, and then come at the harvest. Behold, I say unto you, Lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. And he that reapeth receiveth wages, and gathereth fruit into life eternal, that both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. And herein is that saying true, one soweth, another reapeth. I sent you to reap that whereon ye bestowed no labor. It's entirely the work of God, not ours. Other men labored and ye entered into their labors. And many of the Samaritans, look at verse 39. And many of the Samaritans of that city believed on him for the saying of the woman which testified, he told me all that ever I did. Wait a minute which testified, he told me all that ever I did. She testified of his deity. So when the Samaritans would come unto him, they besought him that he would tarry with them, and he abode there two days, and many more believed because of his own word. And said to the woman, Now we believe not because of thy saying, for we have heard him ourselves, and no that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. All from saying, give me to drink. Opening an opportunity to, to witness, using what's at his disposal there. So, uh, I was touching on something that is meaningful and important to her, to start a conversation so he could say, if you knew who I am, if you knew who I was, who I am, if you knew who Jesus was, is, can be. You can be saved. It's not about religion. It's not about traditionalism. It's not about being good. It's not about weighing good against bad. It's not about denominationalism or any of this kind of stuff. It's about the person of Jesus Christ. And if you're preaching the cross, the burial, the resurrection without the deity of Christ, you're preaching the gospel wrong. You must Preach the deity of Jesus Christ. You must present the true Christ. Because many people, everyone has an idea of who they think Jesus is. From witches to occultists to atheists to pagans, Hindus, and all the rest of them. They have a, they have a Jesus in their mind. You must show them the true Jesus Christ. The living God, almighty God, who came into the world to save. And how far he'll go to even weary himself. God will weary himself trying to call you. The love, the mercy, the grace, how far he's willing to go to forgive your sins. This is what Jesus showed this woman. Such a simple illustration. Using the well, a well of water, that which brings life. 
A Jesus that is not God does not bring life. Our Father, we thank you for this day, this time, and Lord, for the power and truth of your word. Lord, that you'd help us to understand and to take these things into our hearts and minds. And Lord, that you'd give us opportunity to share this with others. Lord, that you'd uh, send us and show us and open the doors, the ways. And Lord, we thank you for all things. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.